Uh, okay, you're good to go, Mayor. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Zoom uh, Town Council meeting. Uh, adequate notice of this meeting, as required by the Open Public Meetings Act, was provided through the posting, mailing, and filing of the annual notice of regularly scheduled meetings of the Town Council on December 11, 2019. The notice was, on that date, posted on the bulletin board in the municipal building, provided to the Westfield leader and the Star Ledger, and filed with the clerk of the Town of Westfield. Mrs. Rowley, may I have a roll call? Mayor Brindle? Here. Council members Habgood? Here. Parmalee? Here. Agrippo? Here. Katz? Here. Mackey? Here. Contract? Here. Jardia? Here. Boys? Here. Thank you. Can everybody please rise for a salute to the flag? I have one behind me, but I have this one too. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United States of America, United States of America and, and to the Republic, to the Republic for, which it stands, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God, under God indivisible, for indivisible, for liberty, and justice, and justice for all. Thank you all. Um, uh, before we got in, go into um, our uh, updates and so forth for the night, we have a very important proclamation um, to read. So bear with me while I, um, while I read this. Uh, it's our proclamation um, uh, proclaiming that June is L LGBTQ Pride Month. So, um, so I'm going to read this because I think it's very important. And then we're going to be addressing more about some updates about this month and what we're going to do about it in my remarks. So, whereas lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer Pride Month is celebrated each year in the month of June to commemorate the anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion in New York City on June 28, 1969, which most historians consider to be the birth of the modern LGBTQ movement. At the time, police raids on bars catering to LGBTQ pat patrons were common, but that night, the violent response ignited a national firestorm of activism that brought new visibility to the struggle for LGBTQ equality. And whereas, all people deserve to live with dignity and respect, free from fear and violence, and protected against discrimination, regardless of their gender identity or sexual orientation. And whereas, as mayor, I am steadfastly committed to the town of Westfield as a welcoming and inclusive community to all. And whereas, to advance that commitment, it is important to celebrate Pride Month to honor the history of the LGBTQ liberation movement and to support the rights of all citizens to experience equality and freedom from discrimination. And whereas, while issuing a presidential proclamation in June of 2015 declaring June as Pride Month, former President Obama spoke these important words. Over the course of more than two centuries of striving and sacrifice, our country has expanded civil, civil rights and enshrined equal protections into our constitution. Through a struggle and setback, we see a common trajectory toward a more free and just society. But we are also reminded that we are not truly equal until every person is afforded the same rights and opportunities. That one of us, when one of us experiences discrimination, it affects all of us. And whereas, the existing patchwork of legal protections for LGBTQ people in the United States leaves millions of American citizens subject to bullying and discrimination. How can it be that in 2020, only 22 states and the District of Columbia prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity? And whereas, while society at large increasingly supports LGBTQ equality, discrimination and prejudice still exists, highlighting the need for continuing education and awareness efforts, and whereas celebrating Pride Month influences awareness and provides support and advocacy for our LGBTQ community and serves as an opportunity to act and engage in dialogue to strengthen alliances, build acceptance and advance equal rights. Now therefore be it proclaimed that I, Mayor Michelle Brindle, in support of the rights of all LGBTQ citizens to experience equality and freedom from discrimination, do hereby designate the month of June, 2020 as Pride Month in the town of Westfield. 
Oh, Scott with the, uh, with the, um, uh, with, with, with the flag. Very nice. I should have worn my rainbow pin. So um, anyway, so we'll, I, in my remarks, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do to, uh, to commemorate that. So, um, so Jim, why don't we start with you with your remarks? Sure. Um, a lot of things going on tonight. Uh, so I'm going to keep it very brief, uh, but a couple of things to update the public on and the council members. Um, again, all the budget documents, um, the final budget document, the user-friendly budget, the budget Q&A, the, um, all the different things we have is all up on the website. Um, and so anyone who has any questions or has wants to review things can go there and you can see not only 2020, but I think about 10 years or more of history uh, of all the budgets there as well. So, um, that process is finally wrapped up from a documentation perspective, but as we discussed, it never really ends. Uh, Couple other good things, uh, the mural, uh, the mural, the second mural that's under the uh, South Avenue, uh, North Avenue uh, um, traffic circle area. Uh, the canvas is all called, the plywood and the railings were installed, uh, finished up, I think it was late last week. Uh, now we're waiting for the artist, uh, Ricardo, to come over and start the actual painting. Uh, if you haven't been by there, you'll see a big, you know, white uh, uh, canvas for that ready to go. And um, we're excited for Ricardo to, uh, to get started on that and complete that that section uh, of the two murals over there, which is exciting. So, and again, that's important to note that those uh, the money is being spent uh, on that are all through donations, very generous donations uh, to our public arts uh, fund, which has been wonderful. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Public Works and also SEI Construction in town who donated their time to install the railings and Public Works, Richard Eubanks particularly, who was able to work with them, to get the proper plywood and so forth. So that really worked out great. Um, and lastly, Mindewaskin Park. It's been a long time coming. Um, today is one of the final steps in the process. Uh, the road was paved yesterday, um, uh, and um, or you know this was last year or last week, I guess. And uh, today they striped the roadway, so all the new parking um, spaces were striped. Um, we added some uh, new handicap accessible spaces, uh, some new crosswalks that didn't exist before due to some pathway realignment. Um, and uh, really looks nice, uh, and uh, the park is truly open as of today. Police Department, we're working with Chris McAloon and the Engineering Department, um, uh, removed all the barricades today after striping was done, so the park roadway was open today for the first time. Um, so the only things in the park uh, that still are closed due to the pandemic is the playground. Uh, interesting note about the playground, uh, Public Works was able to get in there last week to do the long way to plant things around the playground. So that was uh, completed uh, and uh, it's been uh, temporarily fenced off for the time being um, until we can get back to playground play. And the last piece of the uh, Mindewaskin um, uh, Park is again, the, the donation from Columbia Bank to Friends of Mindewaskin and the gift to Friends of Mindewaskin to us with the, the water fountain slash dog fountain, um, which uh, today Public Works was out in Mindewaskin uh, Eugene Watkins and his crew is uh, digging the trench to install the plumbing. I think uh, tomorrow morning we expect the plumbing uh, company to be here and begin to uh, put the plumbing in. So we're hoping by later this week, the, the last piece of the whole puzzle um, that we had set out for some years ago will be finalized, uh, have the water fountain being put in. But uh, the park does look great and Public Works will be back out soon to do some more work and landscaping and so forth. But uh, it's a long time coming, but it's uh, nice to have the park drive open again. So. Um, those are the main updates. I know you have a lot of stuff to say, Mayor, so I'm sure we'll have other things to say later on, too, about a lot of the, the uh, legislation, but uh, anyone who has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer anything. Thank you, Jim. Yes, it is a very, very packed agenda for us tonight, and uh, as Jim knows, I walk through Minduaskin regularly and call him regularly from the park, <laughs> ask him what's going on. So uh, it, it, it looks beautiful. It really, I, I don't think it's ever looked better than it does right now, so thank you um, for that. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for again joining us virtually tonight. Just want to remind everybody that the um, public comment will only be accepted via Zoom. We are live streaming only on Facebook, but your comments must be uh, input, you know, submitted via Zoom. And there's also going to be a replay on um, Facebook, YouTube, and TV36. So uh, uh, just a bit of a COVID update, and I'm going to abbreviate this, and we'll have more details in the update um, that we'll post online. But um, in New Jersey, there's 100, 164,796 cases, 680 still under investigation. The county reports 16,302. And since my last report on Friday, we have three new cases. Um, it was zero on Saturday, 
um, uh, and Sunday, two on Monday and one today. So our total cases is 279. Um, we've had five cases since we are here. I met two weeks ago. It's great news. Um, I think if we can just keep it at this minimal moment, uh, you know, about it, 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 every day, I want to, one here and one there, I think that's something that we could all appreciate and be grateful for. So thank you to everybody. The social distancing and the mask wearing and everything is clearly working. Just briefly, a few important updates that Governor Murphy um, mentioned today. He did lift the stay at home order, very uh, importantly. Um, he also increased the maximum gathering limits for both indoors. Um, uh, 50 people or 25% of capacity, which is a lower outdoors to so 100 people. Um, when it goes on June 22nd, um, uh, it, it goes up to uh, 250, and then on July 3rd, it goes up to 500. So um, all outdoor recreation entertainment businesses that were previously closed may reopen, with exceptions of amusement parks, water pipes, parks, playgrounds, and arcades. Um, and, uh, and anyway, we're going to be, and as many of you heard, uh, the pools are allowed to open on June 22nd. I think there's a meeting this week with the Rec Commission and the Pool Committee to understand like what that means for uh, our town, when they're going to be open, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but we expect fully Memorial uh, Pool to be open and um, specific dates and protocols to be announced as they get more information. So they are still looking at day camps. It's a little bit tricky because they can't use the schools. Um, uh, the school facilities, so uh, day camps, it's a little bit probably more up in the air, but guidance will be coming that, that coming on that with the Recreation Commission's input um, in the very near future. Uh, regarding what's been going on here locally, as many of you know, we had an incredible Black Lives Matter peaceful protest on Sunday in Mindewaskin. I do want to thank once again our public works, our fire, and our police. We're working so closely with the high school organizers to make it a peaceful um, event and it was incredibly well organized uh, and I think any of anybody who was there was unbelievably inspired by the Westville High, High School students who organized it all on their own um, and I had no idea what to even expect when I showed up and it just said our future is in good hands if that generation is leading the way because it was truly unbelievable. Uh, and from my perspective I was also very happy to see that nearly every single person in the park was wearing a mask um, and I, the police and DPW were there handing them out to anybody that walked in without one. We tried our best to keep social distancing, but you know, I do want to make sure, and I've said it over and over again, we need to make sure that our public health trends keep moving in the positive direction. So if you attended that protest or any others, or feel like you've been in any position where you may have been exposed, please go and call and make a, a call Union County, a call the testing site and make an appointment at Union King University. It's free, it's quick. Um, and uh, my daughter went last week and she was in and out in five minutes. So please consider doing it. So then at least you can feel comfortable and confident knowing that you are not an asymptomatic individual carrying and spreading the virus. So, um, so but to, even though uh, moving on to the pro from the protest, it was obviously extremely successful in expressing, I think, our community and collective desire to rid our community and country of racism. Um, but I think we all agree that it means our work is really only just beginning in order to make Westfield a place of equality and inclusion for all. Uh, we need some concrete action steps to ensure that the racism of any kind is not tolerated here. So to that night and very um, serendipitously, um, we're appointing our HRSC committee members tonight, which is one of the first things that we're gonna do. I held my first meeting with the Human Relations Advisory Committee um, last week. And again, we're formally appointing them tonight. In addition to those that are on the committee, we also have several public liaisons, including Police Chief Battalora, Fire Chief Tony Tiller, School Superintendent Margaret Dolan, our Ministerium Representative Rabbi Ethan Prosnit, and representatives from both the Seniors Council, the Public Arts Council, and there's a high school student representative who will also be bringing into the fold and, and will be engaging all of the students that we saw so effectively advocating for, for their cause on Sunday. Um, so after our first meeting, the Human Rights Advisory Committee were in the process of refining the mission and identifying priorities, which will then be shared with the community and additional volunteers will be sought. So they really are just a facilitator um, to help identify and put plans into action, but we are absolutely going to be engaging as many members of the community who are interested in helping this very critical initiative move forward. Um, and regarding policy, as we're, as we're on the subject, in particular police policy, I am going to let Chief Battalora address 
the policy reforms that are already underway, many of which he has instituted as part of the accreditation process and his transition to community policing. So, but I do want the public to know that this council is prepared to have frank discussions and take meaningful policy action in collaboration with the chief, who, ex who has expressed his desire to work with our public safety committee to examine data and recommend policies to address any issue that may be considered discriminatory. We are very fortunate that we have this chief at the helm at this point in time, and I'm gonna let him speak a little bit about many of the reform initiatives that he has already initiated or planned. So Chief Battalora, do you mind, uh, mind giving everybody an update on some of the things you and I talked about today? Sure, thank you, Mayor. Uh, first off, uh, to, to reiterate something you just said, one of my first priorities when I was appointed chief uh, was to uh, initiate the process of accreditation. Uh, a lot of our standard operating procedures were archaic. They were in dire need of updating and, and reissuance. And um, we've hired a professional outside consultant to assist us in that process. We've uh, been very busy since the beginning of the year. We've probably reissued at least 40 to 50 new standard operating procedures, uh, including a new use of force one, uh, an 18 page policy, which was issued back in May, March of 18, uh, check that March 18 of 2020, which addresses a lot of the issues that have, have come to the surface today. Our new use of force policy um, explicitly identifies what a chokehold is um, and uh, explicitly prohibits it, except in those instances in which deadly force would be warranted. So a lot of the issues that um, are being uh, brought up today in policing as a whole um, have already been addressed by our our accredi uh, accreditation process here, uh, and most notably our use of force. Um, I am fully committed to making any changes in this police department that are necessary uh, in order to best serve all of our people. Uh, I am committed to the governor's and the attorney general's excellence in policing initiative. Um, I will take any and every needed action to ensure that another George Floyd incident does not occur um, and to end any type of systemic racism that might be perceived in law enforcement. His death should have never happened. Uh, and I am confident with our, our revised policies, procedures, our standard operating procedures here, that it will not happen here. Um, I will work with anyone and everyone to ensure that it does not. Um, and yes, a, a, as we've discussed repeatedly, Mayor, um, I do not like the appearance of military equipment in, in the hands of civilian law enforcement. It, it sends the wrong message to the people. Um, we are trying very hard here at the Westfield Police Department to build relationships with the community, uh, to earn their trust and to confidence, not destroy it. Um, I believe military equipment just destroys our appearance in the eyes of the public. So we are working to, to return or to sell uh, just about all of it. Um, whatever cannot be returned or sold will be destroyed. Uh, we just destroyed another two military surplus vehicles within the last week or so. Um, and we've signed an agreement uh, to sell a large quantity of it to an entity in Pennsylvania. And we expect to begin the process of transferring that equipment to their possession uh, as soon as it reopens following the coronavirus uh, restrictions. You should also all know that we have a very robust professional standards program in place here in the Westfield Police Department. Um, I've been investigating internal affairs complaints myself since 2006. I've served as commander of that unit since 2012 until my appointment as chief. Um, Lieutenant Jason Carter is now assigned to that function and his work on many complaints has been reviewed by the Union County Prosecutor's Office, which has found our work to be very thorough and very complete. Um, I cannot remember the last time we received a complaint regarding the use of force, let alone sustained one. Um, but I'm not willing to rest on those merits. We will do whatever we can proactively to ensure that we don't have such complaints. I do want you to know you have a very professional police department here. We will work hard to keep it that way by making whatever changes are necessary. And you have my word on that. Chief, can you uh, provide an update on the union contract? Because I'm hearing from a lot of uh, police folks who are disappointed they don't have a contract yet. Could you elaborate on that? or? I'm actually going to refer that to, to uh, Mr. Gilday to answer. Yeah, I just, um, we don't discuss personnel matters in public uh, forums. And uh, uh, I will say the police department and the town continue to uh, have discussions with their uh, the attorneys and so forth. But uh, normally we don't discuss personnel matters in public. Okay. Chief, uh, another thing I've been hearing from uh, a lot of folks about uh, Villani, who passed away in 2006 in police custody, I believe um, you were mentioned. Can you elaborate on that or? 
Actually, Councilman, can I just do a thing? Can we reserve these comments for, can we get through the agenda and then we went into more discussion? We can address some of these as a, uh, so we can just stay on track and then we can address them at a, at a later date. And so, okay, if you could just, and Mark, if you could mute your phone, I think it keeps coming through. So that would be great. All right, can we go back to the chief later then? Uh, of course. Okay, thanks, Chief. Uh, um, so, um, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Chief. And, and I know um, Councilman Darty, as Chairman of the Public Safety Committee, is prepared to work with you guys as well and really review. And I just want to, you know, we will be incredibly transparent, plan on sharing whatever data and people will ask with the, uh, you know, from the public. And we appreciate your support and willing to, to collaborate and be as transparent as you have always been from the day that you were sworn in. So thank you for that. Um, so um, let's see, where was I? Uh, and so uh, following up on the, the, the pride proclamation that I just read. So um, we did last year, you may recall that we raised the pride flag at town hall for the first time in our history. Um, and it just didn't really feel appropriate to do it this year because flags are still flying at half staff um, to honor the victims of the pandemic. So we are looking for a way that we could find a way to visibly, visibly commemorate the month. So this year, we will be painting rainbow crosswalks at the intersection of Elm and Quimby. Not only does this honor Gay Pride Month, but it longer term, it memorializes rainbows as a symbol of hope that we've all seen over town the last few months. So this initiative is gonna be led by the Westfield High School LGBTQ Club, who's gonna work with the local artists and town officials to bring this uh, vision to fruition. And, and Dawn and, has been instrumental in helping make that happen. So, and that we, we are committed to having that up in June before, uh, uh, while we're still in the midst of Pride Month, so. Um, hey, uh, real quick, uh, how come we can't uh, put the gay pride flag up like we did last year? It just, felt, great. We, it just felt a little bit inappropriate in light of the fact that flags are still at half staff. Okay. And so um, it's just that for no other reason than that. I believe Cranford did though, didn't they? Yeah, they, they did. And I think everybody makes decisions based upon what they think is, a, you know, in the best interest of our community. It just felt difficult to celebrate that at half staff when we're there everything else. So I think we're all in agreement that the rainbow um, uh, crosswalks would be incredibly appropriate and longstanding. Um, and everybody seems to be very happy about the, that. The, yeah, I, I, I personally prefer the flag, but I understand your position. But as far as the crosswalks, what do the uh, town professionals say? Because the Federal um, Bureau of Traffic recommends crosswalks are painted white, and we just had a fatality in... Uh, in uh, as, you know, as you know, Councilman, that there's rainbow crosswalks all over the country. This isn't unique to Westfield. So um, there are absolutely ways that it can be done in compliance with, with, with standards. So, and that's what we intend to do. Chief, could you elaborate how, for your opinion on public safety? I mean, that is a busy intersection. You know, so, what, I, let me let me let me just 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 an FYI, Mark. So um, we, uh, uh, Councilman Mackey um, and the mayor, have talked about how we're going to achieve this to make sure it's safe, but also achieve the desired results. So Craig Gibson from the Public Works Department, who's a downtown supervisor. Obviously, we'll be talking to him and see how we can work with the uh, the high school uh, kids uh, in this uh, in this group to get this done effectively. So the details we don't we don't know as of right now, but that's the you know what, the, what we want to do. So we're going to work that out and get it done before the end of the month. All right, but yeah, I, naturally, high, naturally high school, we would, are these high school kids public safety experts? Mark, uh, as, uh, naturally, we would never do anything that compromised public safety, and it would be done in collaboration with our safety officials. It's not unusual to do this. As I said, it happens all over the country. So um, it will be done safely and appropriately. So, okay, yeah, let's, I, if we I can still move prefer on. the flag, but go ahead. Yeah, Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I, I do want to, for good news, um, Westfield High School's graduation will be taking place on July 9th. Um, I've been speaking to the governor's office. I spoke to him this morning. I spoke to Superintendent Dolan. And obviously that was just prior to the announcement that 500 people will be allowed at outdoor gatherings in early July. So um, I'm speaking with Westfield High School Principal Mary Spendis tomorrow to discuss what we can do, how we can do it, and, uh, and details on that will be coming and released very soon. So um, very, very happy to be able to give the seniors the graduation that they deserve. 
Um, on to reopening. I do want to thank the reopening task force uh, for their work in developing our initial downtown reopening plan. Hopefully there's a press release that went out about it today. Um, we had lots of people on this task force with diverse ranges of experience and perspective, and we also had input from over 2,000 survey participants. And we're trying to plan, a, a balance the importance of public health with the needs of like local businesses and consumers. Many businesses were extremely concerned of closing off the streets too much to would, uh, inhibit their curbside pickup. So I think we found a really great um, solution with the, thanks to the leadership of Bob Zuckerman. So you may have read beginning next Monday, uh, retailers will be permitted to expand their footprints by utilizing outdoor sales space so they can put things, retail experiences in front of their stores. Restaurants will be able to use sidewalks for expanded outdoor dining capacity. And we're gonna have 15 minute parking designated for curbside, curbside um, uh, pick up all on Quimby and Elm and on East Broad between North Avenue um, and, uh, and Central. And Quimby is going to be closed to vehic vehicular traffic on the weekends for additional outdoor dining. So as uh, we are trying to be very adaptable and um, it's all going to be driven by feedback that we get from businesses and what we see is happening to make sure that, you know, we're feeling we're, we're really prioritizing public health. So, but I think um, we had a great call this morning with many of the uh, webinar with all the, many of the businesses that attended to answer questions. And I think everybody seems like to, that we came to a really good place. And I think the understanding is everybody's just going to have to be very um, uh, flexible and adaptable. And I say that to the public as well, that um, first, I want to thank everybody for sustaining our local businesses through this pandemic, and I would just encourage you to keep that sense of supporting local while through this trial period. Be patient. Um, know that we're trying to work hard and accommodate, and it's kind of a learning experience for all of us, but um, uh, and so much gratitude they have for, the, the, for what they've seen from this community, and we expect that to continue as we reopen, and I know everybody is thrilled to be able to be back, down, back downtown. So. Um, so news to come, more to come on that as, uh, as, as it moves forward. Um, and last I do tonight, as I mentioned, we have a very uh, important uh, and packed agenda tonight and there are some um, really significant ordinances that are coming, products of months of work by many of the town council's various committees. And really much of what I, I think many of us promised when I was elected, and I know the count, the folks that ran with me were elected, and it's a commitment to historic preservation uh, efforts, um, a greener and sustainable community, broader representation on issues, issues like mental health, and, event, and we'll see on seniors too, and a transformative strategic plan for revitalizing our downtown reflected in the area in need of rehabilitation designation. So as I've said previously, Charting the course for our town's future means embracing change and making bold decisions to reflect the values of our community and the feedback that we've consistently heard from residents on quality of life issues that matter to us all. So, um, so it is a big night for us. We're gonna be introducing a lot um, and it is very consistent, I think, with what we've, been, what we've committed to. I certainly, I've been committed to for the last two years and we're starting to see the fruition of a lot of that groundwork um, and we'll see it tonight. I look forward to the conversations and subsequent conversations that are going to follow about it. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for their engagement, especially in these midst of unprecedented challenges that none of us could have been prepared for. I just, we are not out of the woods by any stretch, but I am thrilled that we can re resume some normal functions of our lives as we can increase gatherings and downtown reopens next week. So I just hope we can all remember to be compassionate and respectful of our neighbors, wear a mask when in proximity to others, maintain social distancing and wash our hands. Um, these really are the only tools at our disposal to make sure we maintain the progress we've made. And reiterate again, if you feel you've been exposed or you feel like you're in a situation where you weren't able to maintain proper um, uh, protocols, please go get tested at Kane um, just so you can be sure. So now I think let's move on to the business at hand. So first is appointments. Um, I would like to name council appointments to the Human Relations Advisory Committee. All, all these appointments will be through December 31st of the stated year. Alexis Jamal, who's the chairwoman, uh, December 31st, 2022. Cheryl Swift, December 31st, 2022. Rodney Ross, December 31st, 2022. Varsha Iyer, December 31st, 2021. Claudia Ramirez, 2021. Michelle Coyne, 2021. Jenny Tannenbaum, 2020. 
Rami Sarabi, 2020, Gary Tim, 2020. And the alternates are Lori Clancy, December 31st, 2021, and Debbie Goddard, December 31st, 2020. So I want to thank all of them um, for, um, for uh, volunteering. They were one of the many, uh, many of the applicants we had. We were very committed to making sure that we had a very diverse committee. And we're very happy with, uh, with the diversity, I think, that we were able to achieve. And I think it will, uh, and the benefits of that will reveal itself, I have no doubt, in due time. As I mentioned, we do have liaisons, um, and the high school is going to play a significant component of this as well. So I do want to thank, certainly, Chief Bellor and Chief Tiller, um, who are here with us tonight, for their willingness to serve as liaisons, and, uh, and again, and the others, too, as well. So we look forward to that. Um, so, Mrs. Rowley, do we have any advertised hearings? Yes, Mayor, there's an advertised hearing for General Ordinance Number 2171, an ordinance providing for the implementation in the Town of Westfield of the five-year tax exemption and abatement law, pursuant to NJSA 40A colon 21-1. So, anyone wishing to be heard, please virtually raise your hand to make your comment. Be sure to include your name and address for the record. And again, these are comments for General Ordinance Number 2171. Okay, so let me check the uh, attendees, see if anyone has any comments on this. You can give me a, a little bit here, give people a chance. Don't see any comments, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, this hearing is closed. Councilor Mackey, please move for the adoption of General Ordinance Number 2171. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to move for the adoption of general ordinance number 2171 on second reading, an ordinance providing for the implementation in the town of Westfield of the five-year tax exemption and abatement law pursuant to NJSA 40A21-1. May I have a second? Second, Katz. Second by Councilman Katz. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Habgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Lagrippo? No. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Councilman Dardia just texted me. He lost his connection. He's going to be um, dialing back in. I think you can you can move on, Tara, and then okay. Councilman Boys. You're on mute. Yeah. You're mute. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Mayor Brindle. Yes. Uh, this motion is carried. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from the town council regular meeting of May 26, 2020? So moved. Uh, moved by Council Agrippo, second. Second. Second, second by Councilman Hapgood. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Yes. Opposed? This motion is carried. Uh, Mrs. Raleigh, do we have any petitions or communications? No, Mayor, we don't. Um, now it's time for open discussion by citizens. Please virtually raise your hand to make your comment on any subject on which the council has jurisdiction and be sure to state your name and address for the record. Okay, we have a few uh, people here. I'll let me go in order that they came in. Uh, pick this person. I have people raising their hand. I'm not able to open them up for some reason. Uh, hold on a second here. Get it done again. Strange. So that means uh, we have five people that raise their hand. Let me just uh, figure out why I can't. Uh, Uh, why well, can't open them up? Uh, 
to say. Uh, Jim, the web yeah. administrator can open them up too. I know, I just, I just let him know that. Um, it looks like we, he's on, Jim. Jim, Don right. Valane is available to check. Oh, there you go. There you go, Don, go ahead. Uh, give your name and address, Don. Don Villani, 633 Cumberland Street in the beautiful town of Westfield, New Jersey. And okay, Don. I would like to do, I want to address the town council regarding the handling of people, handling of people with mental illness. Now, it's just a statement I want to bring up. I know there's a big movement currently going on with Black Lives Matter and how the police and the community need to address it. We also have another party of our community and our society that needs to be included people with mental illness. Mental illness knows no color, no race, no creed or sex. It has a nasty stigma and is therefore usually ignored. There are not many voices that speak out in their behalf. So I need to bring it up. I need to bring up the past about the death, death of my brother, Robert Bellani. It was a horrific situation that went all wrong. Robert also died at the hands of the police, the Westfield police. When I heard and saw, saw the story about George Floyd it brought the past smack into the present. After several days of constant reporting, I, as well as all the other family members, my brothers, my children, my nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends all said the same thing. They remember the story and they remember hearing about the eyewitness statements that my brother said, I can't breathe. I can't and will not sit back and ignore the fact that it happened. I can only let my voice join in with the others that feel the pain of injustice from the Black Lives Matter movement and speak out on behalf of my brother, Robert. I have tried for over 13 years to make a change, but I felt as though my voice was a whisper. I need to know that his death was not in vain. Our family realized that the way Robert was handled was considered okay. No wrongdoing occurred. Even as per our police chief, Battalaro said at the time when he confronted my parents that my brother was dead, he said, we were just doing our job. And we understood that that was the status quo. That was okay. We realized that the protocol or the lack of it needed to change. We strive for education for all of the police. What was done was not okay and should not be okay. Apologies were looked at as an admission of guilt, even though we weren't looking to sue. Apologies were never received, and the efforts for education of all officers involved was minimal. We are upset that changes have moved at a snail's pace, and I am embarrassed that our town has taken so long to finally make and admit that changes need to be made. So what I need to see is what is being done and what will be done to enforce changes of what is okay, what is crossing the line, and what education is being offered for all officers to make sure that the past will not repeat itself again and again. Why was there, how, why was there only 14 officers that took the CIT class in the last nine years? Why has Battle, Chief Battalaro not taken the class? He should lead by example. I feel that we really need to make better efforts. I understand that changes are supposedly being done, but I would like to see what is. And I would like to be able to meet and see in documentation, whatever there is, so I can make sure that this town is as safe as I feel it should be. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Um, and uh, I'll just say one thing, and may, I don't know if the chief wants to, has any comments on that, but it's very timely. And, and I'm sorry, uh, when I read the story about your brother, that was, um, uh, that was, I, I, it wasn't a story I had really heard before. So it was um, interesting. And so tonight, one of the things we're doing is appointing and formalizing our mental health commission. And um, knowing that mental health just in the community and overall is something that has absolutely not been um, proactively addressed in, in a meaningful way. And one of those things that the Mental Health Commission um, should and will be looking at is policy. And I know that they've already had some conversations with Chief Battalora over the last year to talk about um, police procedure and, and dealing with mental health issues. But, I'm incredibly sorry about your, your brother and you're absolutely right. Um, it should have been and it will be a teaching and learning experience for all of us. So, um, and I appreciate you speaking up here, um, Don, and I'm, I'm really sorry 
about your brother and, and to you and your parents and your entire family. And you're right, it sh that, that shouldn't happen um, with proper training and, and, and protocols. Thank you. Now let's see the change. That's right. Um, uh, okay, we have um, other gentlemen. Um, Uh, Mr. Korfmacher, I want to give your name and address. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is uh, Dr. Walter Korfmacher. I live on 252 Hazel Avenue in Westfield. Go ahead. And I'm a long-term resident of Westfield. And, and I just want to start by thanking uh, the Westfield High students that arranged the Black Lives Matter demonstration on Sunday, uh, June 7th as well as thank uh, uh, Mayor Brindle for supporting the demonstration and giving a short talk at the demonstration. I was there and, and I saw her and I thought she gave a, a, a good talk. In addition, I want to uh, voice my support for the new revised solar panel ordinance that allows uh, street facing solar panels without a variance as long as they meet certain aesthetic criteria. While I had asked uh, for a total repeal of the current ordinance, I believe that the updated version will be acceptable to most people and should allow those people that want to add a solar panel to their own house roof to do so regardless of whether the roof is facing uh, the street or not. And that's it, thank you. Great. Thank you, Walter. Um, and Walter, we should tell you, we don't want you to, we actually are making one minor change to, to the ordinance and decided to not do it tonight, but postpone it to the next one to make sure that we get it absolutely 100% right. So, um, but thank you for your persistence on, uh, on the solar panels. I know you've been talking to this, talking about this, I think, for almost two years. So we look forward when, when, when it actually gets voted and passed on, but we want to make sure we get it right the first time. Thank you, Mr. Barbantra. Um, all right, next person, uh, Mr. Stillifson, I'll give you your name and address. Andrew, you're on mute. Andrew? Mr. Stillifson? I think you're ready to talk. Mr. Tillerson? He's back on mute. Yeah, well, we'll uh, <coughs> we lost him. We, yeah, we, we lost, we we lost him. Come back. He'd want to come back in. Uh, next person, um, Mr. Rizk. George Rizk, you want to give your name and address? Yes, uh, um, uh, my name is George Rizk, living on 370 Orenta Circle in Westfield. Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, members of the Town Council. Some of you might remember me uh, back in March 2016 when I came in front of the Council to voice my frustration because of the ordinances pertaining to the solar panels. And uh, back then I was planning to install the solar panels and I couldn't get the variance because of this antiquated old fashioned ordinance we had in place since 2016. So uh, <clears throat> quickly, I'm not going to take too much time, but before I talk about the solar panel, I would like to thank Mayor uh, Brindle for your uh, daily emails, what I call the 9 p.m. emails that I was waiting for my wife and I to receive them and to get the update, understanding what's happening in our town and to be able to probably react to this uh, crisis. So thanks again. Uh, and I know it's not going to be daily anymore, so it's okay. <laughs> we can get it <laughs> twice a week. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Green Team and Amarish Mehta. They really worked diligently and pers uh, with persistency to get the changes to this ordinance. I thought it was going to be easy. It took them a year, more than a year and a half to work on that. But I understand now by reading the draft. Uh, I just want to uh, say the reason why, of course, this is a, a private matters, personal matters that affects me personally, me and my wife, 
But the two reasons, and without necessarily one reason more important than the other, that um, we should support the new ordinance is that we can do small things to, to help our environment, uh, but, and little things can lower our carbon footprints. We're not going to save the plants on our own, but small things that each one of us can do uh, will help, and this ordinance will help, will help many people to really do their share uh, in, in that particular area. The second reason, which is more personal, it's financial reason. Uh, I mean, for some reason, our electricity bill for the past 10 years, I couldn't make PSEG really for, for them to explain to me why for two people living in a relatively medium-sized home have to pay between 250 to $350 a month. It was crazy. They sent their technician many times to try to do uh, and run the tests because, and, and all our uh, uh, electrical appliances were energy safe and all that stuff, nothing worked. And until today, I still have to pay between $250 and $300 a month. Based on the, my own calculation, once I installed the panels, including the cost, and all the things that will come with it, I will be able to save between 200 to 250 dollars a month, which is not small change, particularly for a retiree, for anybody actually. So I would really like to ask uh, the town council to do the right thing and approve the ordinance as per the current draft and with some minor changes, but at least allow us to install solar panels on the front. Uh, uh, on the side of the roof, uh, the front of the street. And thank you very much. Sorry, I was too long, maybe. No, thank That's you okay. very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, okay, so next person we have is uh, Mr. Cody. You're on, you're on mute. Hi, uh, yes, Cornelius Cody, 337 First Street. Sure, go ahead. Hi. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, the mayor and um, the town, and the chief of police for their response to the Black Lives Matter protest in Westfield. Um, these uh, demonstrations have been taking a place across uh, not only the country, but the world. And in really a unique fashion, the amount of people coming out in the suburbs and in towns like Westfield um, is really unprecedented in my lifetime, at least. Um, and so I would like to thank everybody for their support and um, for their, yeah, for their support. Um, my concern is with the new developments of the condominiums and apartments between uh, South Ave and First Street, um, specifically the areas surrounding Holy Trinity, uh, both the church and the school. Um, I've been speaking with my neighbors a lot recently about the development and the impact that that's gonna have on traffic. Um, we already feel that there's a severe under enforcement of parking in this area to the point where um, many of us are constantly uh, having to interrupt AA and A meetings, um, basketball games, other events at the church or other events at the school to um, get our driveways unblocked um, and struggle to make it out of our own driveways in the morning. Um, and so going forward, I hope that the uh, town has a plan to address the increased um, traffic caused by the new residences uh, in the area and um, potentially uh, having more strict parking enforcement and potentially painting lines uh, for parking. Uh, thank you, Cornelius. And one thing you should know, and maybe you do, is that we are embarking on a, um, a townwide circulation plan, which circulation meant just that, addressing like traffic and hot spots and that kind of thing. And um, it's the first time ever that the town has done a townwide circulation plan that's in it being going to be integrated with our land use element in terms of our master plan. So for the first time, we're going to be able to take a very holistic view of traffic management in the town because a development in one place could end up actually having unintended consequences of traffic in another place. So um, you're going to hear a lot more about that. It was they've been trying to re. Uh, visit a little bit how they're going to do it. It's been hard to measure traffic when most people aren't going anywhere. So, um, but that is about to get back up and running through lots of other different ways. And we're going to be asking the public to participate 
on uh, on many uh, on many of these things. So I hope that be aware if you get, don't get our updates, please do because we'll be inviting the public to attend, and you should absolutely come and advocate and talk about any issues that you may be experiencing where you live. And, and Mayor, can I just add one thing, um, Mr. Cody? This is Councilman Contract who represents Ward Three. I imagine Mark Lagrippa, my my counterpart. Anytime you see a blocked drive or you're an issue like that, please call the police, call your neighbor. I mean, call, you can let us know, but take pictures. Like we absolutely want to make sure that the rules are enforced. We've had, you know, off and on issues around Ward 3 and the police are incredibly responsive. Um, also, I'd love you to follow up with me because there are other measures that could be taken, you know, uh, short of the uh, circulation plan that the mayor referred to that could make a difference. And we've had to do this on Grove Street and a few other places in Ward 3. So if you can, uh, reach out to me, I'd appreciate it. And we can uh, touch base and, and take the appropriate actions. Absolutely, Cornelius, thank you so much. Cornelius, real quick, it's Mark. I know people haven't worked in a while, but do you, do you find a lot of commuters park there or is it uh, a lot of the high school students or a mix? Um, yeah, uh, my neighbors and I actually uh, spoke about how great it is right now, unintended consequence of COVID, that we're able to get in and out pretty freely. But um, it's definitely a mix. It's a lot of people um, who live in the condominiums, I'm not sure the name, that are adjacent to Holy Trinity, the ones that have been there, um, right. park out there a lot, um, as well as when school is in session, the high school students. Um, and then it does appear that there's, um, when I used to commute to the city and walk past there, um, a lot of uh, commuters, probably, right? yeah, uh, probably less, but um, of the problem. But it's mostly centered uh, whenever there's an event at Holy Trinity, either church or school, which um, during normal times is many nights a week. Right. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Next person we have is uh, Robert Kelly. Kelly. Hi, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Um, Bob Kelly, 188 Harrow Road. We've been here for 38 years, and this is the first time I've addressed the town council. We have had two houses knocked down on the block um, in the last 45 days, and we're happy about that because it's progress. But there's one house in the middle of the block that's really out to central that has a vacant lot next to my house that is absolutely a disgrace. They've chopped down trees and just thrown them into the vacant lot. They've knocked down just empty, empty everything. You just name it, it's there. We've asked numerous times and the town does a great job in the first 10 feet from Central, from uh, from Harrow Road or uh, yeah, Arrow Road in, but it's from that the other person's and them. He lives in Garwood. He rents. This is a rental, um, and I, I don't know what can be done. I don't know what the what the rules are, but uh, I know if it was mine, I would be mortified. And I think as I drive through Westfield, it is easily the probably the most disgusting plot of land in the entire town. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, Mr. Kelly, this is Councilman Contract again from Ward 3. <laughs> Didn't realize we have quite a lot of Ward 3 uh, constituents tonight. <laughs> Thank you for raising this. Um, absolutely, the town can do a lot. We've, again, unfortunately had similar situations on other properties, either knockdowns or, or teardowns or not. And the, pro the town has property maintenance codes that need to be enforced and are enforced. The best thing to do, and I'll, I'll sing, swing by tomorrow morning, is um, take pictures. Please send them to myself. You can include Councilman Lagrippo. Our town uh, acts. Uh, Mr. Gilday will follow up with our property maintenance officer who will issue violations. There's a 30-day cure, cure period. Absolutely, we have codes that have to be followed, and you have to keep your properties neat. you got to keep your grass cut. You can't do what it sounds like you're describing. Uh, and I hope that whoever cut down the trees followed our new tree ordinance, tree preservation ordinance. And I'll ask that the, uh, that committee look into it because uh, there are fines if you don't. And I, and I understand and I, I get it, but you're talking about they're building million, probably 1.5, $1 $1.6 million homes that are gonna look out their front door and 
and one there back door and see this, I'd be mortified. Mortified. Rob, are you back up to Oxford? Are you back up to Oxford? I back up. I am on the corner of Oxford and Harrow. Okay, because that's the that you're next to the town lot next door, right? Yep. Okay. That um, well. And that lot belongs to the man who lives in Garwood, who rents those those three apartments that are in that that apartment that house in the back door. Yeah, I think the Jim. Can you elaborate? The town recently purchased that lot, or sold that lot. <laughs> No, so it's what's happening right now is, um, as you said, Mr. Kelly, the, the last 10 feet or so of that line owned by the town, and we do maintain that little strip. Um, there has been negotiations with the property owner to potentially sell the town piece to allow um, the property owner to, uh, to uh, own the whole thing to there, maybe develop that property. So oh, that, that'd be wonderful. That would be something. absolutely wonderful. Yeah, we did do some uh, outreach to neighbors. I don't know if I spoke to you or your wife last year about this um, because, we did. Uh, it, yeah. Oh, you did. I didn't, we didn't know if it went through though. We didn't know if yeah. they actually bought it. Well, yeah, it's still, it, it, um, something like this is contingent upon a lot of different factors. So right. it's still in process, but yes, we do hope that um, that small piece of town could be sold to the, to the abutting owner, which then would allow for development. And then that land would obviously not only be maintained, but maintained very well. So uh, a little more time to wait, but uh, I appreciate your patience. That's okay. I've been here 38 years. I've been waiting. I've been waiting that long. I can wait a little while longer. It's okay. Yeah, hey, Rob, I'm right. I'm right across from you. I pass your house all the time. I'm on Tudor Oval, so I walk oh, through. Then you're, but, and 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 I understand. And I I know it's tough to. And I know that they he just the woman that owned it passed away, and and it 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 handed down. I get all that, but. Um, it, it's it's getting to the point where, and like I said, I've lived with it for 38 years, and I don't, not that I don't care, but I've lived with it. But I, I know the people that are coming into this new house uh, on Oxford, that are on Harrow, that paid 1.5 million dollars to build this new house, and, and to look at that would drive me absolutely out of my mind. Yeah, just just to follow up, councilman contract said even though we're negotiating, we're we're trying to get this sold. The property, we'll send the property maintenance officer out there anyway to see what the condition is. That'd be great because there's there's, there's chopped up down that. trees they just threw into there, and it's just not fair. Okay. Yeah. We'll Thank look you, at Mr. It. Kelly. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank you. Your time. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have next person, uh, Tim Van Epp. Tim, are you there. He's on mute. I think. Uh, he's, he's ready. Tim, you there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, Name Jim. Name and address? Yep. Um, 630 Glen Avenue, Westfield, uh, co-chair of the Green Team. And uh, first of all, regarding the solar ordinance, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Councilwoman Mackey and her code committee, as well as our town attorney, Tom Jardim, uh, for working so closely with us on the Green Team to come up with um, you know, the right uh, provisions. And I agree, um, given today's activities, today's dialogue, that um, a little bit more time is needed. So I'm happy that we'll get that kind of uh, close scrutiny. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of other um, green team initiatives that are either on for this week or two weeks from now. <clears throat> uh, one involving a sustainable land use pledge and the other one dealing with a government energy uh, aggregation. And uh, we strongly support those two as well. And uh, <clears throat> I just kind of want to say that <clears throat> with regard to climate resilience and, and uh, sustainability, uh, there's going to be a lot of requests like this over the next uh, few years. Uh, the state has issued quite a number of reports and plans and programs um, that they are hoping that the uh, towns will uh, help the, uh, help support the implementation and, and meet the objectives of. So um, the state's going to be asking us uh, or providing guidance to us on a number of these. So um, and and not every sustainability provision or or ordinance is um, you know they all potentially have some kind of trade-off. So the green team is hoping that uh, the town and its residents will uh, give the proper emphasis to climate change. It's a really big and really urgent problem. So, um, you know, when you're considering aesthetics versus 
climate change. Uh, keep that in mind. Thanks a lot. Jim, real quick, it's uh, Mark. Uh, they, they, uh, I didn't see anything about the uh, energy audit program in the packet. Was are we supposed to get something or? Yeah, no. I, as I mentioned on Friday uh, in the email that we were that we were working on that, and that was sent out. Um, I believe it was was it yesterday. Yesterday to the council, the updated ordinance uh, uh, to participate in the government energy energy aggregation program with a town um, uh, program. Uh, so that's on for first reading tonight. That was sent out yes, uh, yesterday. Um, but we have no no pricing included in there. Well, no. This is no. This is the first step to create the. Yeah, framework to then be able to participate in the program. So this is just the, the ordinance that creates the framework for us to participate and be a energy aggregation town. The next step after this gets adopted would be then to uh, engage a, a third party to go through that process. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have uh, another person, uh, next person, um, second here. Uh, Mr. Stillifson, are you back, th back again now? Mr. Stillson? Having success with him. Mr. Stillson, you're uh, He's on mute. Yeah. Yeah, unmute yourself. We can make your comments. Mr. Stillson? You can go ahead and speak. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Ah, finally. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry about the earlier earlier problems. Right when you called on me earlier, I got disconnected. My, okay, no my apologies. Don't even name, okay, name so and address Andrew, if you don't mind. Yep, Andrew Stillifson, 667 Fourth Avenue. Um, I just want to make a comment on Ordinance 2179, which is the amended Historic Preservation Ordinance. And um, I want to start by asking a question of the council which is uh, why have the owners of the historically designated homes not been involved in the process of amending the ordinance? Uh, this ordinance is not one of general application, but instead it really just applies to about 25 residential properties in town. And uh, that impact is direct and it's uh, really overwhelmingly negative for the homeowners. Uh, the ordinance gives the town all of the benefits of preservation, but the owners of the homes uh, receive no benefit but all the cost. So accordingly, it, it seems to me it's only fair to involve the homeowners in the process and to get their input input before this moves forward. Uh, what I'm proposing is not really controversial or, or difficult. Um, invite the owners of the designated homes to a meeting and walk through the changes. And, and just as a quick aside, uh, it's really difficult um, to figure out what changes were even made on the version that were posted um, in the council meeting packet. So it's just really hard to even know what changes have been have been made to it. Um, so at the if you want to, if this meeting goes forward with the homeowners, you can solicit comments from the owners, um, ask them for their input. And if the goal is to attract more homeowners to designate their homes, I know for a fact that the current owners can and will give you plenty of very helpful changes based on their own experiences um, with the ordinance. And finally, I want to say that I am disappointed that the amended ordinance is only being disclosed to the public now. Um, I've asked the Historic Preservation Commission for over a year to describe the changes and for the opportunity for homeowners to give input. While um, they didn't give me any answers on the changes, they did promise that the public would get the chance to weigh in. Um, that really has not happened. So what I'm asking the council to do is to engage with the owners of historic homes and to get their input and to really make this ordinance work for the homeowners and um and also preserve westfield history thank you jim it's uh mark um i'm still trying to figure out how was the year 1930 picked uh, randomly in the ordinance does anyone does anyone know anything prior from 1930 prior well, so maybe i could ask um Tom Jardim to respond a bit on that, um, but it wasn't picked randomly, Mark. Um, but maybe maybe we could address Mr. Stillison's questions before we ask additional ones. Um, the um, uh, Andrew, thank you for um, uh, 
asking the question tonight. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the um, very frequent participation that you have in the Historic Preservation Commission meetings. Um, we really would like more people to um, participate in them and given you know, the very strong um, interest of the public that showed up in the master plan process for preserving the historic nature of our town. Um, I hope that that becomes um, a more frequent occurrence. Um, the the um, ordinance changes are being presented tonight on first reading. So this is the opening of the process for getting feedback from the public. Um, uh, maybe when I um, ask Tom Dardim to um, comment on the uh, 1930 date. He can also just give the details in terms of what the process is from here because um, there will be time for the public to weigh in. It also, this ordinance also has to go to the planning board um, for review and approval before it comes back to the town council for a final vote. Um, so while I, I, def I have um, actually witnessed you ask about the ordinance and you have participated in the meetings and heard the discussion around it. Um, you know, the process is um, starting now. So we welcome, you know, all the feedback that you have as someone who owns a historic home. Um, we've also been asking for feedback on the current ordinance from a number of people that live in the district on West Dudley who have expressed an interest in um, designating, you know, their neighborhood um, as historic as well. So, um, uh, you know, we look forward to having further discussion with you before this goes up for a final vote. So is Tom, Tom going to address questions or, or later? I'm happy to. I don't know if Councilwoman Mackey, do you, did you want to address yeah, anything? Um, well, I, I would just like to speak a little bit about, um, you know, 1930 as the point. Uh, that we landed on and it really had to do with um, what a lot of the experts felt was architectural significance. Um, and if we look at houses that were built, uh, you know, um, in the 50s, for example, after the, the war ended, they tended to be um, not as special, not made with the quality material. So, you know, you often hear people talk about pre-war as, um, as a point of architectural interest. So we were trying to you know, encourage a home that um, perhaps was put up at a time when there wasn't great care um, for design and materials, like to encourage that would be the kind of a house somebody would first look to rehabilitate and encourage people that have these architectural treasures to hit pause and consider um, restoring them because they contribute so much to the character of our historic town. And I, I could just say on the date of the 1930, uh, when it comes to that portion of the ordinance, which deals with um, demolitions, um, as you know, Councilman, because you're on the uh, code review committee, we discussed a lot of different ways to go about that. Some towns across the state use um, a year, 75 years, 90 years, 60 years. Other towns across the state do simply a date, uh, 1920, 1930, that sort of thing. Um, the idea is to get to a date where you're, um, uh, when it comes to demolition, you're targeting it towards homes that are old enough and that you may want to uh, preserve as uh, historically designated structures. So um, the date was uh, derived at by the committee discussing uh, the best way to preserve older homes or have an opportunity to prevent them from being demolished. Um, uh, to, could you talk, could you just walk through the steps? Like, so someone uh, has a house, 1928, it's falling apart. Uh, it's an older lady. Uh, she wants to uh, sell a home to a developer. And that's where the concern is. A lot of people are worried what happens after that point. In terms of what exactly? That, well, as far as now you have the Historical Preservation Committee involved because the house is older than 1930, clearly a knockdown. Now, who makes that decision if the homeowner is still able to move forward with the knockdown? Right. So any building that is um, under this proposed ordinance, any building that's prior to 1930 that um, uh, the homeowner is seeking to demolish, um, 
no demolition permit can be issued by the construction official without certain procedures being uh, followed. First of all, um, and I can go through them if you want, but within five days of the demolition uh, application, um, uh, permit application being filed, the construction official um, will provide the application to the historic preservation officer, um, which is really a, a member of the HPC. Um, and if the pre historic preservation officer determines that the building has historical, cultural, or architectural significance uh, in accordance with the criteria set forth in the ordinance, um, then th uh, that officer will notify the construction official of that fact. The HBO will then provide the demolition application to the HPC, uh, the whole entire commission for review. Um, if the HPC agrees with the determination made by the HPO, um, then the HPC has a short amount of time uh, to determine whether or not uh, the house is, house is worthy or the property is worthy of designation as a landmark pursuant to the procedures set forth in the ordinance. Um, and if the HPC disagrees with that determination, uh, the commission has 20, 20 days after that to notify the construction official of that fact and then the construction official can issue a demolition permit. So in a sense, it gives the town the ability to pause uh, or uh, pause the demolition process if, for example, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of a, a home that we all know, uh, the Miller Quarry House, if they suddenly came up with an application and said, we want to tear down this house. Um, uh, it'll give um, the town the ability to take a look at it and say, wait a minute, do we really want to see the Miller Quarry House be torn down? why don't we pause and see whether or not this house should be designated historically um, or other houses that you can think of that might have, um, uh, uh, it might be appropriately designated for preservation. And so they see, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, and that process is consistent with what happens in other municipalities around the state, correct? Yeah. Yes, and actually, Mayor, that's a that's a good point because the changes that are being proposed for the ordinance, um, you know, are going to um, ensure that it complies with New Jersey's municipal land use law, um, and um, in that case, we will be able to receive a certified um, local government designation, which will allow us to apply for a lot of very significant grants um, offered by the state. Um, so it will allow us to have some monies to start feeding into, you know, the um, projects that we'd like to pursue to preserve, um, you know, some of these buildings in town. Which I know, so, um, which I know it's been an issue since day one that they weren't able to be um, state certified and we couldn't get the money to actually invest exactly. in the money in the buildings. We, we weren't qualified, here. exactly, we weren't qualified to apply um, because our historic ordinance um, wasn't consistent with um, the municipal land use law in the state. And so until we make this change, we're going to continue to be ineligible for any um, of those state uh, grant um, opportunities. So this puts us in compliance with state land use law. And the one question that maybe you want to address is that I know Andrew was referencing the impact that it has on currently designated properties. Um, that, can you talk yeah. about the, the impact on current designated properties? Because I didn't think that the ordinance really had any impact on current, de currently designated properties. So I, I, I agree with you, Mayor. Um, in fact, um, in the conversations that I've been involved with as it relates to the adjustments to the ordinance, um, there's been a lot of efforts to, um, you know, try to appreciate, um, you know, the need for acceptance of certain materials that may have um, longevity. You know, we've tried to reduce, you know, color requirements and things like that that make it more expensive or more onerous to um, make renovations to or to maintain um, historically designated structures. So um, it, anyone who in town who has a historically designated home actually in many ways should 
find this quite beneficial in terms of um, the requirements for, you know, ongoing maintenance. Um, but Linda, real quick, I think the way the ordinance is written, even if you have a brand new home, you could wind up in a historic district the way the ordinance is written. I get talk away in a more on that, but that's the way the ordinance is written. Sure. So me, per me, me personally, I don't want to get stuck in a historical district. So could you elaborate that on that? Well, under existing law, you could uh, be part of a historic district. It's it's called a non-contributing uh, property. So if you're in, I mean, there are actually are one or two non-contributing properties in the Kimball Avenue historic district, uh, newer homes that aren't necessarily historic, but they're part of a district nonetheless. So that that's under existing um, uh, town ordinance and that that concept will remain in the new ordinance right so, so even if it's brand new construction you technically can wind up in a historic district right because it's a district it's the kimball the kimball avenue is a is a is one complete street um and just because one home was built in 1963 it, you know it doesn't mean you carve around that house you may and, that, and that exists today that could happen today in the current ordinance. Tom, Tom, what, ta what changed when you, when on um, Walnut, you, you and your residents and neighbors were looking to become a historical district and, you know, we worked, the town worked with you and your neighbors for two years and it looked like it was going forward. Then everyone pulled out. Like what was, why, why did people pull out after two years of working with the town and what, why, what was, what uh, was the, uh, reason at the end there um it's interesting because it did happen on our street um it all the neighbors didn't pull out some of the neighbors decided it was something that they didn't want to do and so as you know under the existing ordinance there's this sort of super majority uh that have to agree um to designation which again is completely inconsistent um with state land use law um uh, because only the town council, uh, along with the planning board, has uh, the ability to um, undertake zoning. And so our current ordinance, in effect, um, gives um, the, the residents sort of super zoning power. So um, our ordinance, as it exists, is very much subject to legal challenge. Um, but in that circumstance, I mean, we're all neighbors, we all get along. Um, uh, some pulled back and decided that it wasn't right for them. One interesting thing uh, that a lot of the neighbors on my street said is that they don't want um, the town of Westfield telling them what color to paint their house. And um, I think the HPC very intelligently heard that comment because it's a frequent comment. And so uh, existing ordinance does allow the HPC to tell you what color to paint your house. And um, the proposed ordinance has taken that language out. Um, as Councilwoman um, Hapgood said, there is some uh, loosening of restrictions actually for currently designated historic properties, both in terms of material and certainly in terms of telling uh, a historically designated property owner what color they can paint their house. Um, and okay. I want so if that was today, if that was today or going forward, then the town could indirectly force Walnut to be a historic district. Uh, if it were so inclined under the proposed ordinance and consistent with the municipal land use law, it could do that. It could do that for, uh, well, again, it has to still meet the criteria set forth in the ordinance as to whether or not it actually meets the historic uh, criteria. Um, it could do that for just Stonely Park. I know there's been an effort uh, to um, uh, to do that for years, but it hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, and yeah, it not me. I was heavily involved in Stonely two or three different times. We tried to go forward with Stonely, and each time people pulled out along the way. So just so residents are clear that going forward, the town or the historic preservation is going to force that upon the residents. <clears throat> Right. So, and I, I also want to just, just address uh, Mr. Stelson's comments. I mean, he has been fantastic uh, in uh, appearing at the uh, HPC meetings almost every month. I'm also the attorney for the HPC. Um, and although um, the, he has not seen, I don't believe, until tonight perhaps, a copy of the draft ordinance, <laughs> certainly he's been there when the HPC has discussed um, the ordinance changes in broad 
concept. Um, and um, I, I would just say with respect to, um, you know, looking at an ordinance, um, most ordinances before they're introduced are, are amended many, many times. And sometimes they're pulled from the agenda, uh, like to, uh, we did twice tonight. This, this ordinance, uh, the HPC ordinance, is literally a 39-page document. It has been amended dozens and dozens and dozens of times um, because of its very complicated nature. I wouldn't want, no other town in the state that I'm aware of uh, does that, put out an ordinance like that before it's introduced by the council. Um, but as Councilwoman Hapgood has said, this is the start of the process. This has to go to the planning board for its review. Um, the planning board um, has a minimum uh, uh, up to 35 days to review the ordinance. Um, so this is the beginning of probably a, a minimum of a, a 45 to 60 day process um, before it comes back to the council and is uh, voted on on second reading and possibly amended again, possibly reintroduced if the comments are sufficient enough from the planning board. Um, so in terms of public input, there will be plenty of opportunity going forward on that. Um, so this is Andrew Thorpe again. Uh, I just want to make one comment and I appreciate there's a process to go through, but it seems to me it make a lot more sense to get the input from the homeowners ahead of time rather than after the fact and in a very formal process. And the fact that you were able to solicit comments from interested homeowners on West Dudley and not the current owners is really su surprising to me. It's, you know, the homeowners are known. It's very easy to call a meeting, invite people to the meeting and get their comments. I, I, can, I can guarantee we can make that ordinance better for the homeowners and better for, for preservation. I can guarantee right. that. So I'm, I'm really surprised that, that it was solicited from, from Worth Dudley, but not from the current owners. It's really surprising. Yeah. It, actually, I, I can address that um, because um, I've had several meetings with the uh, neighbors on West Dudley who are interested. Um, I mean, they, they took it upon themselves after the meeting to read the ordinance and send comments to us. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, anybody in town has the opportunity to do that. And, um, you know, so Andrew, there's plenty of opportunity going forward in this process that we're in now that is going to, you know, stretch over, um, you know, two months probably, um, you know, so let us know what your thoughts are on it and we'll take them um, into consideration. Um, so. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Andrew. As I said, there'll be plenty of time and the planning board, and as a reminder, the chairman of the planning board just designated his home. So uh, uh, obviously he brings that perspective to it, to the review process as well, but there'll be lots of plenty of time to weigh in. Um, and I do think, again, this is a uh, historic preservation is something that we've heard over and over and over again as a priority for our town. And I think it's uh, now's the time for us to really act on it in a way that uh, preserves our history for the long term. And, uh, and uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity here to make a big difference. So appreciate your input. Thank you. We have um, one other person, Mayor. Um, so we can get them, Mr. Simpson. Yes. Simpson. Yes. Hi, this is Greg Simpson, 500 Salter Place. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just wanted to um, first thank uh, my uh, one of my ward councilmen, Mark Parmalee, for responding to an email today about this historic preservation um, issue and um, echo Mr. Silfson's comments that uh, more inclusion from current uh, homeowners of historically designated homes would be great. I live in a pre-revolutionary war home. And um, I think the, the more we involve people that have homes on, on the registry, the more people we could, we could get to join the registry. If, if it was a, a mutually beneficial uh, relationship, I, I think it would encourage more people to put their homes on the registry so that we feel like we're, we're, we're working together versus uh, ordinance coming out that we don't, you know, we're not familiar with and don't know are there, are there you know, uh, detrimental uh, consequences or, or beneficial. That's, that's why, you know, uh, I was on an email with, with, with Mark today and he was able to tell me, you know, some examples of where it is beneficial, like being able to change the color of the paint of your home. But, uh, but I think if we work together, I, I think we'll have more uh, historically designated homes in this town and, and more happy people that, that live in them. So um, thank, thanks for all the discussion that happened before this. I, I raised my hand and then the discussion went on and on. So um, 
for that time, just my input. Thank you. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you for you know your commitment to historic preservation, and hopefully you can set a great example for others in the community. Um, may on, I, I just uh, may may I speak on that? Sure. Piece? I just want to um, address um, what Councilman Lagrippo um, slipped in that the town was going to force people. And I just want to be clear that it is required to be compliant with the state that the municipality have the power to designate without a homeowner's consent, but that the administration has no intention of um, forcing this on any individual homeowners. It was just um, necessary to be compliant with um, state law. And Councilman Lagrippo um, should know that because we discussed this for a very long time. Um, it made us uncomfortable until we understood that's what was necessary for compliance, and it was not a power that we and we needed to use. Thank you, Councilwoman. We have another okay. uh, another resident. Um, oh, got it. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Burslam, are you there? Yes. Yeah, your name and address? Debbie Burslam, 256 Kimball Avenue in Westfield, New Jersey. Okay, Bad. I am very fortunate to live in the town's only designated historic district. And I just um, want to tell you that I agree with what Andrew said. And I w honestly was very surprised. I have not been able to attend historic preservation meetings for I don't know, maybe the last eight or 10 months, but I attended faithfully, faithfully almost every month, more than many commission members since 1998. And I have been asked personally and very willingly gone to speak to other people in this town to talk about the advantages of living in a historic district. I will say though that I'm very surprised that it wasn't until I received an email from someone late this afternoon to find out that this ordinance was even happening. Because, you know, and, and I'm grateful that it's happening. But again, I, I honestly believe that um, input is a good thing. This town has been asking for input on all sorts of things for the last two and a half years, which I think is great. Exchange of communication is wonderful. Um, the people and the residents, and I'm not speaking for everybody, but it is my impression that the residents of the Kimball Avenue Historic District have a wealth and a depth and breadth of knowledge that many people may not have. But we have it because we've lived it. We, we have the, the benefit of so many people that have done all the research. And, and I just think it would be smart to, you know, maybe even just give us a heads up that it's happening. I appreciate that you don't have to, but there's only a handful of properties that are designated in what are there 10,000 plus households you know it, it would be good for the council to advocate and just say hey by the by this is going on and um, you know I just I just think it would be it be smart a good resource that's all thank you thanks Debbie, it was nice talking with you this afternoon about this. And, um, you know, I, um, we're always open uh, for people to comment on um, to us about our ordinances um, and how they're not working for them. Um, and, um, you know, I, this, is, this has been a pretty open conversation at the HPC meetings about the fact that we're, we've been working hard to um, try to adopt a ordinance or make adaptations to our ordinance so that we can be consistent with the state law and thus be eligible for these state grants because one of the biggest problems we have is that um, we need money to be able to maintain our historic buildings so um, please read through what's posted up on the website um, as the current draft and um, you know let us know your feedback on it we welcome it we obviously understand that people who live in historic homes um, are um, some of the folks that we need um, the most input from. Great. Uh, okay, I don't see anybody else, Mayor. I think that uh, that would, uh, hold on. Um, we have one other person, uh, Mr. Cody again. 
Hi, yes. Um, I was just reflecting over the meeting and I just wanted to add one quick thing when it comes to the crosswalks um, in Westfield. Um, yeah. It's just that my uh, recommendation is that um, not only does it include the colors of the rainbow, but a brown and black stripe for the crosswalks um, to include uh, people of color who are most affected by um, issues in the LGBT community and face uh, greater oppression than, um, than other uh, sectors. Thank you. Okay, I think that's, uh, I don't see anybody else virtually raising their hand. Okay, so uh, here I close this portion of the meeting and move to bills and claims. So Councilor Hapgood. Okay, sorry, I'm scrolling down to where I need to be. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, sorry. Um, I'd like to move bills and claims in the amount of $2,609,904.82. May I have a second? Second. Second by Councilor Mackey. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Opposed? Uh, this, uh, this motion is carried. So next is reports to standing, co standing committees, beginning with the Finance Policy Committee. Councilman Hapgood. Thank you, Mayor. I have nine resolutions that I'd like to move as a package. A resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant to refund street opening cash bond. A resolution authorizing the CFO to refund recreation department fees. A resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant for dog licenses for May 2020. A resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant for unused parking permit fees. A resolution authorizing the CFO to draw a warrant for overpaid taxes in 2020. A resolution authorizing the CFO to draw warrants for the year 2019 pursuant to the Tax Court of New Jersey. A resolution to award contract for the website redesign services. A resolution authorizing the purchase of lighting in connection with Westfield 300 celebration and a resolution authorize, uh, establishing payment schedule for the Board of Education tax payments. May I have a second? Dardia, second. Contract. Okay. So, second by Councilman Dardia. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. yes. Yeah. Opposed? This motion is carried. Uh, okay, next is the Code Review and Town Property Committee. Councilor Mackey. I have two resolutions that I would like to move as a package. First is a resolution supporting a sustainable land use pledge, and the second is a resolution to approve outdoor seating as per Executive Order Number 150 and authorizing the town clerk to issue licenses to stain. May I have a second? Uh, second contract. Seconded by Councilman Contract. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Uh, this, uh, this motion is carried. Councilor Mackey. I believe there are nine ordinance scheduled for introduction tonight. The first is General Ordinance Number 2172, an ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the Town Code of the Town of Westfield. New Jersey in order to regulate the hours during which loud mechanical equipment may be used. I would like to move general ordinance number 2172 on first reading. May I have a second? Second, Boyce. Second by Councilman Boyce. And, and Dawn, do you just want to tell everybody what it is, what this ordinance does? Basically, what this ordinance does is it takes the hours that can use um, loud lawn equipment on Sundays, um, uh, brings it down to 5 p.m. instead of 8 p.m. as a response to many residents who are looking for a little period of time um, of a respite. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, please call the roll. Councilwoman Habgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Lagrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion is carried. 
Next, I would like to move general ordinance number 2173 on first reading, an ordinance amending the code of the town of Westfield, New Jersey, as it relates to the storage and delivery of pre-manufactured modular homes and building components. May I have a second? Second, have good. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Habgood? Yes. Councilman Parmley? Yes. Councilman LaGrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion is carried. I would like to move general ordinance number 2174 on first reading, an ordinance establishing the Westfield Mental Health Council for the town of Westfield. May I have a second? Second, LaGrippo. Seconded by Council LaGrippo. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Hapgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman LaGrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes, this motion is carried. Next, I would like to move general ordinance number 2176 on first reading, an ordinance to Establishing a government energy aggregation program. May I have a second? Second. Second contract. The second, I think, Councilman Parmalee, beach to it. Um, <laughs> I had to unmute. <laughs> any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Habgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Lagrippo? No. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Yes, that was a nod. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boys? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion is carried. I would like to move general ordinance number 2177 on first reading, an ordinance amending the land use ordinance to establish and regulate boarding houses. May I have a second? Second. Second by Council Agrippo. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Hapgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Agrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boys? Councilman Boys? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion has carried. Um, and I do, and, and just to remind everybody I know is that these, what we're doing tonight for the public is we are introducing these ordinances. We are not voting on them. So it's just a uh, vote to introduce them for public discussion to vote on them later. So I just wanna make sure the public is very clear on what it is we're doing tonight regarding the introduction of these. There is time to vote on them subsequently after appropriate review. like to move general ordinance number 2179 on first reading an ordinance establishing a historic preservation commission and providing for the designation and preservation of historic districts and historic landmarks in the town of Westfield. May I have a second? Second. Seconded by Councilman Hapgood. Any further discussion on this? Uh, Mary, this is uh, Councilman LaGrippa. I think Tom, thanks, did a nice job uh, explaining. Um, I'll be voting no, as I feel it's a bit of an overreach by government, but uh, uh, just want to say I'll be voting no on it. 
All right, as a reminder, it's just to introduce the ordinance so that we could have the discussion. So, uh, so, um, but your vote, vote is noted. So um, please call the roll. Councilwoman Hapgood? Yes. Councilman Parmley? Yes. Councilman LaGrippo? No. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Uh, yes, this motion has carried. I'd like to move general ordinance number 2180 on first reading, an ordinance to amend the land use ordinance of the town of Westfield in regard to wall mounted signs for corner lots. May I have a second? Second. Second by Council Magrippo. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Havgood? Yes. Councilman Parmalee? Yes. Councilman Lagrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes, this motion is carried. I would like to move general ordinance number 2181 on first reading, an ordinance to amend the land use ordinance of the town of Westfield in regard to the definition of accessory building or structure. May I have a second? Second. Second, Katz. Okay, right, Councilman Katz. Uh, any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Hapgood? Yes. Councilman Parmley? Yes. Councilman Lagrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. 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 Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion is carried. Lastly, I would like to move general ordinance number 2182 on first reading, an ordinance to amend the land use ordinance of the town of Westfield in regard to dimensions of garage parking spaces. Can I have a second? Second. Parmalee. Second by Councilman Parmalee. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Councilwoman Hapgood? Yes. Councilman Parmley? Yes. Councilman Lagrippo? Yes. Councilman Katz? Yes. Councilwoman Mackey? Yes. Councilman Contract? Yes. Councilman Dardia? Yes. Councilman Boyce? Yes. Mayor Brindle? Yes. This motion is carried. Um, Mayor? Yes. Yeah, I just want to make one, just go back to the uh, resolution, the second one that, that uh, Councilman Mackey um, move for adoption. So I make sure everyone understands uh, this has been a lot of collaboration behind the scene. This is for the outdoor seating as per executive order 150. Uh, between, uh, thank you to, to Tara, Tara, Clara, Tara Rowley's office, town clerk's office, Tom's office, uh, Bob Zuckerman, the downtown West corporation and chief Tiller's office. Um, this is a collaborative effort to help business downtown expand their outdoor seating and with the reopening task force and, uh, Tara's office with Tom's help is ready to go for tomorrow. Um, getting the applications out for the, for, the, uh, for the businesses, which I believe we're waiving the fee and the ordinance or the resolution tonight uh, for 2020. And then um, hopefully uh, approved applications and uh, a lot of outdoor starting next week as per the executive order. But uh, a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Uh, but again, it's uh, Chief Tiller's office will be very busy, I assume, the next uh, two weeks after this uh, with some enforcement of these things and making sure that uh, the, uh, um, the uh, wow. businesses comply, make sure there's ADA compliance on the street, but also expand their opportunities downtown. So it's a lot of detail behind the scenes. So I thank everybody that was involved. Uh, thank you for bringing, bringing that up. And it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it, and Tara, it's gonna be a tremendous amount of work for her office as well. So, so thank you to everybody. Um, while we're talking business, I think Councilman Parmley, you had an update for We Love Local. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I don't want to get it lost 
kind oh, of yeah. at the end of a long uh, council meeting. But, and I think this kind of dovetails nicely with the fact that the town is just beginning to reopen. But I have to say, um, so the We Love Local Fund uh, wrapped up um, at the end of May um, and we were able to, um, well, we received almost $277,000 worth of donations from more than 850 residents uh, in the town. Um, and this is something that we couldn't have done without the help of the Westfield United Fund um, and the Westfield Foundation, and specifically Deirdre Galeen and John Walker from the fund. Um, and then uh, Councilwoman Habgood and Councilwoman Mackey uh, and us uh, and myself um, were able to distribute uh, funds to uh, more than 175 local businesses. And uh, most recently, we were actually able to up uh, the, the distribution to some of the businesses that had the most employees. And so, you know, so that, that, that comes to a close at a perfect time, right when the town is beginning to reopen. But I think it says a lot about how much the town cares for its local businesses, how much it really uh, uh, put itself out by, you know, in addition to, to ordering pizzas and, and curbside delivery, uh, but, but actually to, to uh, donate uh, funds out of their own pocket to help the employees and the owners of these, uh, of these uh, small retail businesses. And so it was a great effort uh, that was spearheaded by you, uh, Mayor Brindle. And, uh, and I just wanted to thank everyone involved for a, a really great job uh, on behalf yeah. of the town. And, the business. and it meant, you're right, it meant a lot to the businesses, even as much emotionally as financially. They said they felt the love from the community and it's what sustained them. So thank you for that. Also, um, Mayor, um, uh, Councilman Dardia has a public safety committee. Oh, great. Yep. yep. Yeah, sure do. Um, so at the top of our meeting, um, Chief Benaloro had mentioned uh, police reforms and um, just Again, I want to reiterate how the Public Safety Committee is committed to work with the police department and any other appropriate entity to review data, uh, review police reforms, and uh, commit ourselves to improving community policing. I, I also want to quickly uh, address the recent fatality that took place at the intersection of North Scotch Plains and South Avenue and say that uh, the Public Safety uh, committee will be reviewing that report uh, for the purpose of uh, understanding exactly what took place, uh, reviewing with the police department the facts of the matter, and uh, trying our best to implement any improvements to avoid uh, future accidents at that intersection. Uh, likewise, uh, the committee is also going to be reviewing the reports of recent accidents in Ward 3 for those same purposes. Um, so, uh, on to the issue of, uh, of bike lanes. So, our uh, bike walk report uh, provided a lot of great recommendations and the Public Safety uh, Transportation and Parking Committee members reviewed those recos and developed a prioritized list. And um, interestingly, bike lanes uh, came to the top of that list and uh, we were all in alignment in terms of uh, moving ahead with that. So uh, with that said, we'd like the town council's approval to move to the next step of applying for an NJ DOT bikeways grant uh, to implement bike lanes in town. Um, additionally, uh, we'd like to apply for an NJ DOT grant to implement sidewalks in areas uh, where it was highly recommended to improve uh, pedestrian safety. So that too came out of the uh, uh, like walk and bike plan. So uh, your approval is key because uh, the grant deadline is coming up. It's January, July 1st. So uh, would like the uh, town council's approval that there. Um, and just just on that, Mike, just so the council yep. knows, so that the this is our annually we apply to the Department of, of Transportation from the state road improvements. As you know, we usually do larger road. This year we got money uh, for for last year's application provided money for this year's paving of uh, a large section of Scotch Plains Avenue. So we will continue to do the road uh, submissions, but we're looking to add two things to that request, which we are allowed to do. There's different sections of the DOT grants, one's for bikeways specifically, and one's for municipal aid, which takes a uh, roadway uh, request and sidewalk installation requests. So as Councilman Darney mentioned in the bike and pet plan that was done, there was a whole sidewalk identification section 
that actually identified missing sections of sidewalk that were highly recommended to be top priority. So uh, with your approval, Chris and I will be able to uh, uh, work getting the applications done and submitted, and then we'll wait for their, uh, their response. But we, we think we're in very good shape as we have a great plan that was also done by NJDOT consultant. So uh, I think we're gonna be in good shape for getting uh, a good one uh, for these grant applications. So right, that's just the, you know, to, to bolster my comments. Sounds great. Yeah, just a couple more things. Um, so I'd like to also announce uh, that the Public Safety Committee is working with uh, the Green Team's Transportation Subcommittee, uh, spearheaded by Jay Goldring. Um, and uh, Jay and his team would like to implement a, a bike lane demonstration project later this summer. So uh, more details to come in regard to that. Uh, lastly, uh, in the last few weeks, I've been working with Councilman Contract and CATS on a program to increase bike safety among kids with a special focus on getting more Westfield kids to wear helmets. We've gained a lot of support from local businesses, the high school, middle and middle school mountain biking team, uh, our police, fire and health departments, and even children's specialized hospital around this effort. And uh, we've stressed that this program is for kids by kids. And uh, so, and that, and that seems to be catching us as we're seeing a fair amount of interest uh, in participating in this program uh, by kids. And uh, in fact, today I got a slew of emails from parents who, wants, who want their uh, kids to, to participate in this. And um, so just quickly summarize, it, it's a multifaceted awareness campaign uh, and uh, combined with some in incentives for kids to, to uh, wear helmets. And I, as I said, it's for kids, by kids, so kids are gonna be driving this effort. Um, and uh, like I said, we do have a lot of kids who wanna participate already, but we're looking for more. So if you're a parent out there who wants the kids to participate in this really cool program, please email me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. So I think. Uh, Can I, I mention, shall, uh, Mayor, two quick. And we'll wrap it up with Public Works Committee. Yeah, so um, I, I think the whole council saw in, in the meeting notice update that we're prepared to launch the adopt -the drain program um, starting, I think, tomorrow, uh, which is exciting. It's a chance for residents to pitch in and help out and be recognized for taking care of their sewer drains. As a reminder, As a reminder we... whoa, <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. Sorry uh, for the feedback. So we've got over 3,000 sewer drains and I know there's probably a few dozen residents. I know uh, Jim Gilday and myself are among them. Um, so the program is a really turnkey way for residents to sign up to adopt a drain and take care of it. It'll keep debris out of the, out of the watershed, out of the storm drains. It'll help minimize localized flooding and you can easily pick your pick your drain on a map and give it a name and report how much debris you prevent from going down the drain. So really appreciate it. There's more details that'll be on the town website. Of course, you can reach out to me if you have any, uh, any questions. The program's actually being managed by Lois Krauss, who is doing this as part of her environmental stewardship project uh, and program through Rutgers Co-op Extension. So we really appreciate Lois's effort. She's on the green team and she's going uh, for her environmental stewardship training. Uh, and this is her signature project. And then lastly, just a reminder and a request, the town as part of the 300th anniversary is looking for residents, businesses, even cats and dogs and cars who have achieved the distinction of being the oldest something in town. Um, we've received dozens of survey responses, but we're hoping for hundreds because there are you know, tens of thousands of people in town. So please fill out the survey. It'll take a few minutes. It's on the town website. If you think you might win one of these awards, fill out the survey. Oldest cat, oldest dog, you know, oldest resident, longest married couple, et cetera. We want to hear from you because we don't want to leave somebody out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for a very productive meeting and thanks to everyone at home who tuned in. So may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Council Lagrippo. Second? Second. Second by Councilman Contract. All in favor? 
Yes. 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 Opposed? The motion is carried and this meeting is adjourned. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you, everyone. Bye. Be safe. Be safe.